Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to another inspiring edition of Inspirational Africans. Today I'm very, very proud of the guest that we have today. I'm proud because of the successes he has struck and the life that he has lived over the years. And we're happy to introduce to you our guest for today. Today on Inspirational Africans, we bring you the inspiring successful story of one of Ghana's patriots who is an icon of hope and integrity for his nation and the judiciary and to whom many will cling for equity and justice. With no hope of being educated, he finally pulled through and became a judge and he is Justice Saeed Kwekujan. Justice Saeed Kwekujan is an appeals court judge who has served the judiciary and the nation in many capacities. He started his career as a private legal practitioner in 1978 and assisted mainly the poor without a charge as charity. By his hard work, he became the chairman of the Ashanti Regionals Investigation Committee and the national chairman for the National Public Tribunal at the State House in Accra that investigated issues of public office abuse in 1986 to 1989. In 2006, he was appointed a High Court Judge at 2nd D and subsequently became the Supervising High Court Judge in the Western Region of Ghana in 2010. Prior to his appointment as a judge, he served on many educational boards such as the Ghana Education Service Sec Party for the Recruitment of Director Generals and Deputy Director Generals, a member of the Administration, Finance and Disciplinary Committee of the Ghana Education Service, Chairman of the Kumasi Polytechnic Governing Council, and many more. In 2003 to 2004, he was a commissioner of the National Media Commission representing the Muslim community. In 2014, he was appointed a member of the Judicial Service Performance and Assessment Committee and a member of the Council for Law Reporting. Awarded as the incorruptible judge in 2012, which makes him the only judge with such an award by the Ghana Bar Association, he believes his success story is just the favor and glory of God. Please stay tuned. So you've seen it all and we are privileged to be hosted here in his house. Viewers, welcome Justice Saeed Kwekujan. Justice, welcome to Inspirational Africans. And it's a great honor to have you on the show today. Thank you very much. Uh, to God be the glory, may Allah be praised. Allah Akbar, Allah Abdullah. Allah Abdullah, Allah Abdullah, Allah Akbar. It's great to be your guest uh, on this program. Uh, I'm humbled. I'm indeed privileged to be considered worthy of consideration to be uh, amongst those selected to be worthy indeed um uh, because of your your you track say, record uh, an inspirational african <laughs> thank you very much so justice um recently our nation was hit by a huge corruption scandal where some judges were caught on tape receiving receiving bribes and our chief justice in an address to the nation decided to uplift all of us not to lose faith in the judiciary and in her speech she mentioned you as an example of an incorruptible judge and wanted us to look on to you to have faith in the judiciary that's such a huge responsibility on your shoulders to carry the credibility of an entire institution of state how did it make you feel sitting back and listening to these words that were spoken about you as an incorruptible judge and someone the nation should look up to as an example of good justice systems. Ahuzbillahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim. I I got the information about the chief justice addressing the national conference of the Ghana Bar Association uh, in the light of the judicial scandal that hit the nation from a former headmaster of, of mine, uh, Mr. IKGC, who was the headmaster of T.I. Amedia Senior School. He called me the very morning after. I hadn't heard it, what had happened. And he said, Judge, 
Something happened yesterday at the Great Hall of the KNUST, and uh, I was uplifted that the Chief Justice singled you out by name, that you were the, the fresh face of the judiciary in the light of the scandal that had hit the institution. I couldn't believe it that uh, I will be singled out by the Chief Justice. But then I look back, and then I recall that in 2012, the Ghana Bar Association at its annual conference held in Takradi had decided to set an example for all the judiciary to encourage the judges to be honest and uh, to consider integrity as uh, an integral part of their calling. And in doing so, they said they had uh, taught all the regions of the country. And I, I had just uh, left the Western region as the supervising high court judge and had been transferred to Accra. They went to the Western region and then they said in their discussions with the bench and bar, they were so shocked by what people said about me in terms of my integrity, my honesty, my hard work, and uh, generally the standard that had left there, that they had no choice but to set me up as the first ever choice for the award for being an incorruptible judge. The spiritual leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim movement even mentioned you, acknowledged you in one of his sermons. So it's a great achievement, undoubtedly. And I want to take you back decades when you were a child growing up. Did you ever think that you'd even end up in the judiciary, let alone be heralded as such an icon of uh, integrity in our country today? I think that God's ways are not our ways. To say I ever dreamt as a child that um, I would be a child, uh, I would be a judge, and that uh, I would be given this citation and this honor by the National Association of Lawyers of Ghana uh, would be a nightmare uh, come true. The truth is that I didn't even think I would ever go to school. Okay. I am a native of a village that the map doesn't know, Ekunfi uh, Ekwitsi in the central region of Ghana, just nine miles to Mankesim in the central region from Accra to Kipus direction. My grandfather was a prominent uh, merchant in the Kumfi area in the 30s and the 40s. And uh, my father was his first child and his first son. My father was very close to him and uh, they worked together. Then my grandfather suddenly died. And as it was at the time, because of the closeness of my father to his father, and we, as Fantis, I'm at the Fanti end, we are Kants, and we inherit matrilineally. So the son doesn't inherit the father. So the family, maternal family, descended upon my father and his siblings so hard that my father decided to go very far away from the central region. And he ended up in a village called Buya, near Pandai in the northern region and, and, and went to the north with the family with his uh, wife and uh, two children now when we went there there was no school there at all so fortunately for me in 1957 the first president uh, the first uh, president of ghana then the prime minister of ghana uh, dr kwame nkrumah decided on his uh, expanded educational program in ghana and because of that, he set up many schools. Okay. And one of the schools, K 
came to my village of Buya. Okay. And so that was the first time that a school was established okay. there. So we were the first group of okay. people to begin that school. So when my elder brother was going to school, I was added up. Uh, I was just added up to the, to the class, okay. uh, maybe because my parents felt that it would be better to send me to school at the time. So I joined them. Yes, my father died when I was in primary five, okay. second time. Okay. Um, I was, like I said, I was with my elder brother. So we went to our village in the central region. And my father's customary successor, who fortunately is still alive, he was to take care of us. So you well, did, after your father died, you left Buya and you we went left back Buya to the central back region? To central region. Okay. And uh, my six brothers and I became his responsibility. For whatever his motive or reason, he kept us at home for two years without going to school. Okay. So for two whole years, um, between 62 and 64, we were at home. After two years, my mother decided that she couldn't take it any longer. So my mother took us all back to Buya, okay. uh, so in the hope that we could begin uh, continue our schooling. Because at that time, schooling in the North was totally free. Okay. And she didn't have to pay anything at all. And uh, it's maybe through the sacrifice of my mother okay. in deciding to go back to the North when the husband was no longer there. That saved our education. Tell us briefly how, about your secondary school experience. At what stage did you start developing interest in the law, if you did develop at all in secondary school? In secondary school, um, sometime in Form 4, okay. somehow, anyhow, I just got a voice in my head sometime. And it just said that you'll be a judge. At that That's time, I had form four. Form four, secondary school form four. Okay. I had absolutely no idea about even becoming a lawyer. Okay. But I'd never forgotten that voice that I heard in form four. Yeah. I finished form five, performed uh, very well, I think one of the very best in the whole of Ashanti region. I went to uh, sixth form. And uh, when we were going to write our examination, the sixth form examination. I had a dream. And in that dream, I'd been called to the staff common room. And I saw a tablet of gold. And I saw all the subjects that I was doing. And uh, like A, B, C, up to F, that's how it is for the lesson. And I was shown my results on that tablet. And so the following day, I went to the classroom and I drew a diagram on this, wrote the subjects and wrote my results on it. I said, that will be the results that I'll have, you know. And I was pretty surprised. But as it turned out, when the results came, it was just about exactly what I said in the dream. And uh, I was once again the best, one of the very best in the uh, Ashanti region. And so when I was going to um, fill the form uh, to go to the university, our teachers, they just look at you, look at your possible results and decide what you should. And so uh, they just decided that I should have law as my first subject, okay. history and political science. Okay. And so that is what happened. So you applied for, you applied for law and you got admission yes, today. Yes, you're watching Inspirational Africans who are listening to the very inspiring story of Justice Said Kwekuk Jan, one of the distinguished justices we have in this country who has been heralded as an icon of integrity. So Justice, here you are, a fresh student in the University of Ghana studying law. How was the experience? You know, I had come from Amelia Secondary School, uh, Kumasi. People had come from Fancy Pim, oh, or the big, big schools. 
A, all A's and things like that. And, uh, you know, Amadeus Secondary School was very strict in discipline and values. And I recall that the registrar of uh, the University of Ghana at the time uh, made an observation that anybody who came from Amadeus Secondary School to the university, from their experience, the results were genuine because the uh, invigilation in the school was very strict. So it didn't matter whether they came with four A's or whatever it is, as other big schools came, you were certain that anybody who qualified to enter the university from a media center school had done school on merit. Now, the first university exam, something happened. My very first paper in political science. I went and wrote the paper and I came back to my hall and I thought I'd performed very horribly. To the extent that I cried, I locked myself up, my friends had to come and console me, so I was encouraged, I built up uh, courage and then went and wrote the exams. It turned out that that particular paper that I was so worried about, I had an A wow. when the results came. Wow. And I just thought that it was a miracle. Yes. Thank you. So Justice, I mean, uh, we're really running out of time, but the story is still expansive. So I'm trying to extract as much as I can get. So you pass your law school, you start practice. Can you briefly run us through your practice and how you rose up to this current place? Uh, as a when we finished the law school, I was posted to do the national service uh, at the University of Science and Technology, Land Administration Research Center. But I went and managed to persuade the director of uh, national service to post me to Amadeus Secondary School, which was my alma mater, so because I insisted that for what Amadeus Secondary School had done for me, my first work I wanted to. Was for Amadeus Yes. The director couldn't understand why a lawyer would want to go to a secondary school, but I insisted he posted me there, and I think it was a very blessed time for me. I, a lot of the students I taught in the first year, uh, eventually, you know, rose up very well. One of them was uh, Mariam Ajiban Jesi, who is now a very prominent Ahmadi lawyer, uh, now in the chambers that I eventually left to become a judge. Uh, I taught him in Serene School Form 1, so when he eventually ended up to be a lawyer, I brought him to a chambers because at that time, uh, I had joined a chambers uh, called Total Legal Service. Then uh, first I, I started work with uh, a gentleman called lawyer A.K. Emir, a very prominent Catholic church member. And uh, I worked with him for two years. For the two years I worked with him, he didn't give me one password. But the good thing is that he gave me every opportunity to learn the law and to learn the law very well. Later on, I joined the PNDC came in 81, okay. 82. Because of my work as a student leader at the time when I was in school, many of us drafted, uh, drifted into the PNDC. I, I, I worked on one of the committees, Ashanti Regional Investigations Committee, as a chairman. Later on, I, um, in 84, I resigned. And then they told me that, oh, I worked so hard they were sending a delegation of lawyers to the Soviet Union at the time okay. to study their um, judicial system. I should just join them uh, like as if I was on leave. I joined them only to find that we were to go to school okay. in the Soviet Union. And for two years, now I had, I had been married and I had uh, my second child who was just three months okay. At the time I was living, so for the Soviet Union. when I went to the Soviet Union and I knew I was going to be there for just a month, and it turned out that I had to be there for two years at least, I was totally devastated and very distressed. And it affected my studies. Okay. And I recall, uh, you know, the whole night I was sit up trying to read the lessons and my mind was just not. So I wrote to the, um, the Halifa, or the fourth Alifa at the time, explained my situation to him. The 31st of 
January 85, I received a reply from the Halifa, and he said, I shouldn't worry. I should just accept the condition and do my best. No, no, the day that I got the, uh, the Halifa's letter, everything changed about my stay in the Soviet Union. And I became the best of the students there. I learned the Russian language better. I became their spokesman. When we were writing our thesis, I was the one who was directing them. And so I thought it was another miracle in my life. When I came back from the Soviet Union, uh, my father insisted that I couldn't leave uh, the government service because they had, whatever it is, had been on government payroll and uh, scholarship for two years. So I was put in charge of the public tribunals at the time. I was, uh, became the member secretary and national registrar of the board of public tribunals and eventually ended up as um, chairman of uh, one of the national tribunals okay. in 1990. So even at that you know, young age, you were still having some bench experience, if, oh, yes, if, yes, if, yes, if, yes, if yes, I was. Yes, so you were, these were all like preparing you for if, if it, a, a, a greater it calling so, later in life. So. so Justice, I mean, we, we're really enjoying this discussion, but unfortunately time is never yes, our best yes. of allies. So I just want to briefly, before I ask you my last set of questions, so when did you get your first appointment as a judge? of the country. 2006. Uh, the senior lawyer of the chambers I joined okay. after I left the public tribunals okay. called me and told me that, look, you are the most senior lawyer in my office. I become old. At that time, it was almost 90 years. Okay. So he said, if I'm not there, you are the one to take Judge. charge of this place. But I think that the time have, has come for you to join the bench. I know you don't want that job, but if good people don't become judges, we cannot blame the bench where they are wrong and they have wrong people there. So just accept to go be, uh, and be a judge for me, though I know you don't want it. He, I respected him so much, and so I accepted that uh, challenge. From him? Yes. And we can say Allah was speaking through him. <laughs> from, what, from our conversations, there's really been a lot of, you know, examples of how God or, you know, how Allah has in many ways shaped your life. How would you say religion and faith and your belief in Allah and prayers have helped shape your successes and your life to this, to this day? For me, uh, God in my life has always been key. And uh, all my life had been dictated by the fact that I thought I was always accountable to God. And when I became a judge, it was the same when I was in the PNDC time. And that time, people knew me. They would say, oh, that Kremuni, that uh, Muslim, when I was uh, in the PNDC at the tribunal, see that man, all the gold in the world, you gave it to him and it will not influence him. Even at that time, that's how they described me when I was working with the tribunals. And so I always had a view that I would be accountable to Allah for whatever I did in public and in private. So my life, I've always seen it as an open book. I've never, I always say that I don't have any secrets in my life. And it is because of my faith in Islam. We know you're a very staunch member of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And I know you write often to the spiritual leaders over the years. How has that also helped you in strengthening your faith and getting the grace of God? In other, you know, your, why do you write? Let me just ask a simple. Why do you write to the Huzul often for prayers and guidance? I write to the Huzul, and it's not only to the Huzul, but also the Amir of Ghana. And uh, apart from that, my village, the community, the Jamaat in my village of Fiekutsi, every time I go there and I worship with them and ask for their prayers. The, the Halifa, I write very regularly to him because I think we am blessed to be a member of a worldwide religious community. And I told you about my experience when I was in the Soviet Union and I was in difficulty and I wrote to the fourth Khalifa and he re replied and he changed my destiny and 
uh, you know, it was a game changer for me. Since then, I've always written to the Halifa. Even your life story in itself but is a great example. One particular experience that I have never forgotten, and I know it's one of the greatest manifestations of God's hand in my life, was that in 2009, I was helping for the last two years, I've been helping my village to build a mosque. We meet every November and uh, Easter time to raise funds. In, the, in, in, in 2009, we were going to meet to raise funds, and I always led the congregation in my village, Ekufie Kutsi, and I didn't have money at all because I'd spend money for some other matter. And just before, the week before, I was going to Accra, I went to the mosque site, and I was walking up and down and praying to God that, look, within a, a week, I have to come and give money. I didn't have money. You just have to do something about it. So I went to my bank, bankers, talked to my bank manager just before, and then the day before I was to come to equity for the function, I went to collect a loan from the bank manager. The bank manager said, you don't need the money. There's so much money in your account. I looked at the account and the computer and I couldn't believe it. He said, you can sign any money. I said, no, no, no. I phoned the judicial secretary who is the head of administration of the judiciary and asked whether they had paid any money to us. He said, yes. Uh, we had been paid arrears of salary for four years. And the money was huge. I had never seen that kind of money in my account before. So when I came, I immediately signed a check for 50 million cities at the time to pay for the next phase of the, um, the project. And then I decided that the remainder of the money, I was going to go to Hajj with my wife. Now my wife is a sickler. For those who know the sickling crisis in Africa, Anyone who has a sickling sickness, it's a very debilitating sickness, like they call it a hyper rheumatism. My wife had had it from a stand. When you can be talking to her in five minutes, you see her, and she has a crisis, and you think that she won't last five minutes. So I went with her to the Hajj, and at the Hajj, she had a vision. She had a vision in which she was walking and she saw a structure, she went into that structure, she was sitting down and she heard a voice in Akan language in Saudi Arabia saying, why are you sitting down and not saying anything? You must say something. So he just, he said, look left and right, he didn't see anybody, but he heard a voice. So he raised his voice and said, in, also in Akan, he said, oh, so when you come to a place like this, you must say something, then he raised his hand and said, God, you know about my sickness. Take my sickness away from me and let me finish my hajj and go safely back to Ghana. I say to the glory of Allah that sickling crisis is a genetic illness. From 2009 up to today, my wife hasn't had a single, single cell crisis since we returned from the hajj. Six, seven years on, we have not had that experience. It is Alice's glory. Thank you very much Allah for joining us on Inspirational Africans. For letting me tell my humble story. We are, we to are Allah proud be to the have glory. had your story. Allah be the glory. Alhamdulillah, 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 Allah Hukbar. Thank you. So, well, viewers, you've heard it all, the inspirational story today of Justice Kweku Jan. He has lived and is still living a great life of integrity and example to all of us. Thank you very much for watching. We hope you have been inspired by our episode today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.